Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the Seattle Art Museum's Saturday University Lecture Series, Color in Asian Art, Material and Meaning. My name is John Marshall and I'll be presenting the seventh in a series of eight programs, Colors of the Earth, Colors of the Sky, focusing on pigments and dyes, colors of Bingata textiles of Okinawa and touching briefly on those of Japan as well. So welcome to the program. Let's get started. Colors of the Earth, Colors of the Sky, Bingata Textiles of Okinawa. We'll be covering a brief history of Okinawa, traditional sources used in the dyes, pigments versus dyes, how to apply these images to the textiles, as well as many dye possibilities. We'll go over a couple of famous artists, how modern dyes relate to these traditional dyes, the permanence of these dyes. I'll touch briefly on some of my work, some dye techniques in mainland Japan that relate to the Okinawan, and then a quick review. If you'll notice in the upper right hand corner, there's a screen by the artist Ogata that was covered in Marco Leona's lecture, Colors of Space and Time, earlier in this series. And in the lower left-hand corner, you'll find a beautiful Bingata piece from the Seattle Art Museum's collection. I'll be touching on both of these pieces repeatedly as examples and inspiration for the samples that I've prepared for you. Let's begin with a brief history of Okinawa, also known as the Kingdom of Ryukyu. She's positioned about equidistance from Japan as well as mainland China, and both of these regions had their eyes on her as a potential conquest. To maintain her independence, she paid tribute to both, and towards that end, she produced ever increasingly exquisite quality textiles, as well as pottery and other folk crafts to offer in tribute. Eventually, the Satsuma clan of Japan took over the islands, but she continued to pay tribute to China. During World War II, the islands were pretty much flattened with bombing and were taken over by the United States. In 1972, she was passed back to Japan. Let's take a look at this map showing the major trade routes during the Ming period. You can see that Okinawa, in the red circle there, is pretty much hugged by the other nations of Asia, very much central to the trade route. This entire region has a wonderful rich history of using pigments for their artistic expression. And of course this had a profound impact on the development of Okinawan culture. There are the ancient cave paintings of Indonesia, the Takamatsuzuka tomb paintings of the Asuka period. These were being excavated just about the time I arrived in Japan, so of course they were of particular interest to me. There are the exquisite temple paintings of China, and of course the eye-popping colors used in the temples of North Korea, as discussed in the earlier lecture, Korean culture in five colors. And of course, Thailand brings us an exquisite history of painting with pigments, both in ancient and modern cultures. And in Okinawa, we find these very same pigments used on textiles. Textiles and patterning that have been developed to a truly amazing level of sophistication. Before we charge on though, let's go over a few terms. Bingata, the politically correct version of bingata, covers katazome and tsugaki as practiced in Okinawa by Okinawans. Otherwise, it's referred to as kataezome. In everyday common use, it actually means any kind of textile that vaguely looks Okinawan or has sort of a tropical aesthetic to it. And I'll be using it to refer to any katazome or tsugaki dyed textiles using primarily pigments with a significant nod to Okinawan colors and techniques. We also want to go over different kinds of colorants. Pigments are topical. Dyes penetrate. Pigments need a binder. Dyes don't, but dyes may need an assist of some sort through a mordant. You'll also find that quite commonly there is no distinction made between pigments and dyes and they're lumped together as things that color fabric, in which case they're referred to as dyes and the process simply as dyeing. Many natural fibers are used in traditional bingata dyeing, the most notable of which are silk, cotton, reimi, basho, which is related to banana, and of course the ever popular cannabis. Colorants also come in many forms. If you look at the image in the upper right, you'll recognize it as a detail from the Bingata piece in the Seattle Art Museum collection. The yellow in the background is a dye derived from a plant called Hukugi, which grows in Okinawa. The leaves are collected and they're brewed up into a tea-like juice. Mordants may also be added to this liquid. If we return to our sample in the upper right-hand corner, we see two other colors, red 
and blue. The blue is an indigo pigment, the red is a pigment made from cochineal. There are basically two kinds of pigments, mineral pigments, which are basically crushed rocks, and also lakes. Lakes start out as these tea-like dyes, such as the fukugi, but the color in it is forced to settle out, creating a sludge. This sludge, or the dried version of that, is applied to the fabric using a protein binder, such as soy milk. This kimono from my collection was dyed by Hayashi Matsuo, my Bingata teacher. She was a rather sad person. This is a photograph I took of her in Taketo Mijima in 1973. And it does help to sort of illustrate her feeling of loneliness, but you know, she expressed her love, her joy, her excitement through her textiles using bright, brilliant colors and wonderful bold patterning. I'd like to use a detail shot from this beautiful kimono to show you the dyes that were employed. Cinnabar was a very commonly used pigment in the ancient world. You may be more familiar with it as carved Chinese beads. It's also a form of mercury. Malachite gives wonderful greens and azurite exquisite blue. All three are mineral pigments, basically rocks. Cochineal, on the other hand, is a lake made from an animal, an insect, and indigo is a pigment made from a plant. In an earlier program in this series, Indigo in two 15th century paintings, Quincy Nian pointed out that the indigo used is believed to have been Persicaria tinctoria. My teacher in this case used Strobilanthus kusia, also known as Ryukyu-ai, or the indigo of Okinawa. Indigo may come from many different sources, a range of botanically unrelated plants. It can also be extracted from animals, all sorts of sources. And my teacher made a particular point of stressing that she used Strobilanthus, so I thought I'd like to share that detail with you here as well. And lastly, we have another mineral, orpiment, which is a form of arsenic. Naturally occurring minerals are abundant in Okinawa. I prepared the map at the right to give you an idea not only of the distribution, but the actual range of colors. If you compare that to the chart of naturally occurring pigments throughout the world, you'll see how blessed Okinawa is with this wonderful natural resource. Perhaps this shot of the painted desert in the United States will give you an idea of just how abundant some of these natural pigments are. Just scooping up a handful and taking it home will give you quite a bit of dye material for many, many projects. Pigments and dyes behave very differently. A pigment is suspended in the liquid. Given time, it will settle out. And for this reason, it sits on the surface of the fiber when applied. A dye, on the other hand, is dissolved. As a dissolved liquid, it will travel with the water to the core of the fiber. Dyes may be extracted from many different sources, including insects and various parts of plants. Pigments, on the other hand, are minerals, as discussed earlier, or lakes. Depicted on the right are the leaves of Persicaria tinctoria, a great source for natural indigo. If these leaves are simply ground up and mixed with water or cooked, they form a dye. The dye gives us a beautiful peacock blue or robin's egg blue, and it does indeed penetrate all the way through the fiber when applied. The indigo shown on the left is made from this very same plant, but processed a bit further to convert it into a lake, giving us this beautiful navy blue. As a lake, it's no longer able to penetrate the fiber. Of course, a little bit of it might soak in, but for the most part, it sits on the surface. I think it's time we took a look at how a lake is formed. This may be easier to understand if we look at how a plane seeds a cloud. The cloud in and of itself is very heavily laden with moisture, but those moisture particles are not quite heavy enough to fall to the ground on their own. So a plane flying overhead and dropping dust particles into that cloud give those moisture particles something to glom onto, become a larger and heavier particle, and as a result, fall to the ground. Instead of a cloud, though, we have a color-saturated dye source. If we seed this dye with calcium hydroxide, basically powdered lime, the color particles glom onto the lime, become very heavy, and sink to the bottom of the container, giving us a lake. In the case of this indigo, you can see in the Pilsner on the far left that it's very alkaline. That's because of the calcium hydroxide. This forms a bleach of sorts. So if I were to go and try to apply that directly to my silk, it would burn it. Bleach is not good for protein. On the other hand, if I'm going to make a vat, it'll work just fine. In order to brush it onto my delicate silk, I need to remove that alkalinity and bring it closer to a pH neutral. And I do that by pouring off the liquid 
adding more water, pour that off, add on more, and eventually all of that lime is leached into the water itself and carried away. In the process what happens is the particles become smaller and smaller because that large clump, that large core of lime has been removed. As the particles get finer and finer, they're better quality, and the pH drops. This is the pigment I want to paint with on my textiles. If I use the calcium hydroxide laden pigment, it would leave my cloth feeling very sandpaper-like. If I can remove that and get the particle down to the finest possible size, then that interferes the least with the texture of my silk. Let's take a look at how indigo dye compares to indigo lake. We'll start with the same Polygonum tinctorium. Now, you should also know that this is called Persicaria tinctoria. It's the same plant. If we simply add water to that, turn it in a blender, chop up the leaves, and then insert our silk, we'll find that we get this beautiful robin's egg blue. Simply through the staining action of the indican and beta-glucose molecules. Pigments and juice dyes do behave differently over time. Textiles in Okinawa must be able to survive the intense sunlight exposure that they receive every day. The artist, in creating the piece above, used both pigments and juice dyes. The dye in the background is most likely barberry or a similar high in tannic acid dye. The fiber is Chinese cannabis. For nearly a century, the textile was housed in a frame, and you can see that the matting of the frame protected the edges from exposure to sunlight, while the center portion Again, exposed to UV damage, faded considerably, to the point where you can't even see the legs of one of the men walking, whereas the pigments have maintained their original vibrant intensity. And it's for this very reason that the Okinawans focused on using pigments in their textiles. Indigo, in both its pigment and its dye form, has played a crucial role in Bingata dyeing. Let's examine this just a bit closer for a moment. On the left, we see the most common use of indigo in Bingata textiles. The fabric may be either dipped into an indigo vat, which still counts as a pigment, or the bubbles may be scraped from the top of the vat and applied directly to the textile as a paint using soy milk. On the right, we see fresh leaf indigo, not normally used in traditional bingata dyeing, but I just wanted to show the comparison. The indigo is being used as a dye. The leaves were again made up into a juice dye, as we saw earlier. They were applied to the background of the fabric and washed immediately, which then gives us the bright robin's egg blue. Afterwards, the paste was applied to create a resist. The dyes were brushed on layer after layer to build up deeper shades and allowed to dry. When fresh leaf indigo is allowed to dry, it gives us a teal green rather than a peacock blue. These are the traditional materials I used in preparing these samples for you. I selected high quality Japanese Reimi, also known as Johu, along with preparing some rice paste resist, pulling out one of my stencils, and applying the image with the rice paste through the stencil onto this Raimi cloth. That's the image you see at the right. The rice paste will function much as wax does in batik to protect the fiber beneath, leaving that portion white or basically blank once the paste is washed away. Now that my paste is dried, I'm ready to begin applying colors. Let's start with the simplest blues. In the three samples you see here, I've used only pigments. On the left is strictly indigo pigment, the lake that you saw made earlier. I've built up my colors one by one, beginning with a pale shade of indigo. As I build up my layers, the blue takes on a deeper and deeper cast, until eventually I wind up with a broad range of harmonious blues. In an earlier lecture, the presenter explained how a scroll had been painted from the back with color before the image was applied to the front. So that's how I've approached the second piece. I dyed the back with indigo pigment before the paste was applied and followed up by applying exactly the same colors you see to the left over my paste to achieve this more subdued look. My goal was to use only blue shades in these three samples. But what exactly is blue, especially relative to the Japanese? Jennifer Steger, in her talk Dragon's Blood, the first in this series, brought up this issue, the difficulty of assigning specific colors to terms in other cultures and across time. The Japanese color Ao is normally translated into English as blue, but Ao incorporates so much more than our concept of blue. Ao 
is the color of the ocean, both deep and shallow. Ao is the color of the sky, the summer sky, a winter sky, a midday sky, an evening sky. Ao is the color of grass, of leaves, of the forest, of rivers. Ao encompasses most of what we might consider blue as well as green. The term Midori, which we translate as green, actually means foliage and has come into popular use only to accommodate the need of foreigners to make this distinction. So with that in mind, I dyed the piece on the right to accommodate all of the shades of Ao I had at my disposal. Folk crafts, by definition, normally use supplies close at hand. In this case, I've popped over to my neighbor's house to help her clean her filter. She has an O3 filter, which is called an ozonator, and it pulls the pigments from her drinking water. And I want those pigments. I wound up with a beautiful maroon brown manganese. Next, I went to my own hand dug well. My water has high iron content and pulled the pigments from it. I decided that two colors alone wouldn't quite be enough so I went to my fireplace and pulled soot from the flue. Armed with these three pigments and a little bit of soy milk, I created the piece on the left. I've gone to the opposite extreme with the right hand piece using pigments that I've made, but also pigments that I've imported, including the orpiment, cinnabar, malachite, azurite, and many other minerals you can see listed at the bottom of the piece. Just to refresh your memory, this is the Seattle Art Museum piece with a detail showing in the background. I decided to approximate a reproduction for you by first dyeing the background with barberry. I didn't have any fukugi on hand. Applying my paste over the top of that and then proceeding with applying pigments. More importantly, I'd like to draw your attention to a particular feature of Okinawan imagery and that's compound patterning. If you'll notice on the left detail, the blue iris and the peach iris are basically flower petals. I mean, they're straightforward uh, colored flower petals. However, just as often as not, you'll find the imagery embellished with additional patterning, as you see in the right-hand detail. In this case, the blue iris has an additional plum blossom pattern added, and the peach tone iris has some waves. If you'll turn your attention to the larger piece, you'll see that both the clouds and the leaves have additional patterning. In earlier lectures from this series, Marco Leona brought up the use of pigments on gold leafing relative to Ogata's folding screens. And Quincy Yan touched briefly on the use of Aobana. I'd like to explore both of those just a bit more with you. At the point I was preparing for this talk, I was just about out of pure gold leaf, so instead I turned to gold yardage. This fabric was prepared by first taking handmade mulberry paper, coating it with a layer of real lacquer from the lacquer tree, and then sprinkling gold dust, gold powder, over the top of it. This process of using gold dust rather than gold leaf is referred to as kindorohaku. Once the gilded paper has been prepared, it's shredded into very narrow strips and woven with silk. The excess gilded strands may be easily seen along the selvage edge. I decided to alter my image just a bit for this sample by adding a moon. Taking a dessert plate, I laid it out on my fabric, and use aobana to draw the outline. Aobana is actually the worst possible kind of dye. It disappears completely on contact with water, so certainly it's not going to stain your cloth. But for that very reason, it's perfect for doing underdrawings. It allows you to do any kind of sketching on the cloth you might like, resting assured that it will disappear later in the washing process. And while I'm at it, I'd like to bring up another interesting feature of aobana. Just as so many Japanese dyes may also be classified as kampoyaku, or herbal dyes in the Chinese and Ayurvedic tradition. These are called the useful plants. They're plants that we use sometimes for fiber, but also for food, nutritional supplements, dyes, medicines, plants that have insinuated their way into our lives in so many different ways. And just to drive home my point, this is a box of aobana humatsu, which is a food additive. I did go ahead and add what little gold leafing I had to the surface just to add some interest. In Marco's lecture, he pointed out that a shell powder called gohun was laid as a foundation over which the blue pigments, in particular lapis lazuli, was applied. In my piece, I first applied the moon using mica. Mica is a pigment, so of course I use soy milk. Over that, I applied my rice paste. I applied powdered seashell to selected areas to create a balance, 
and then proceeded with the rest of my pigment. I have to admit, I don't really care for the results of applying the lapis lazuli over the powdered seashell. It did exactly as Marco suggested in terms of creating a, a heavier, meatier, more pronounced presence. I'm much more drawn to the pigments applied with a lighter hand, allowing the gold to exert its influence from underneath, creating a lighter, slightly more translucent quality. I should also make the point that doing this type of dye work on top of gold fabric is not part of the Okinawan tradition. I found that the range of colors that any given plant can offer us is often underappreciated. So let's return to our old friend indigo and take a look at it for just a moment. At the top of this slide, you'll see a length of cloth, silk, that I've accordion pleated and then pinched with pieces of round wood to block out the dye, after which I put it into a tub of our cold, fresh leaf indigo dye, the one that gives us such beautiful shades of medium range and peacock blue colors. Over the now exposed white roundels, I applied rice paste resist, placing a different image in each circle. In the right hand piece, I used only indigo pigment, building up layers to create a slight differential in the shading. To the left, I did exactly the same thing, allowing for a little bit more extreme difference in the shades of indigo. I washed off the paste and went back and touched up the bottom with a little bit of the fresh leaf indigo dye left over from our earlier project. You can see how it brightens, how it enlivens the entire piece, especially when compared to the image on the right. But these are both colors we discussed earlier. I'll bet you didn't realize that indigo also produces a beautiful yellow. Most plants will give you yellow, as a matter of fact. I brushed on my yellow dye repeatedly to build up the depth of color, went back and applied mordants to very specific areas. The darker stems have a chrome mordant, the darker area of the blossoms have an iron mordant, and the yellower areas of the leaves have an alum mordant. All of these mordants working together to give us several different shades of yellow. Both of these images were first dyed with the yellow, as in the earlier piece, and then over the top of them I've gone back with a brush and applied indigo pigments, building up shadings, creating a range of tones, and trying to introduce yet more energy and interaction of light and dark to give interest to our piece. Earlier, I introduced the term indican, which is the precursor to our navy blue. It turns navy blue when oxygen is added. Then, of course, there's the yellow component, also found in our leaf. And there is just one more that's very important, and that's called indirubin. It's a very different molecule than the indican, and it gives us reds and purples. You can see evidence of the indirubin once the indigo pigment has settled out in creating a lake. I settled on a delicate coral red for use in my peonies. So here we have, first, the yellows applied to the leaves and stems. I went back and applied my dye of the coral peach color, again several layers, and then again I went back on top of that and added shadings, very delicate shadings, of the indigo pigment, giving me the slight navy cast to the shadows of each piece. Now you may not be able to see it on your screen, but between the two top peonies, I also added just a hint of the fresh leaf robin's egg blue to help pop the colors just a bit. In Quincy's earlier talk, he showed us a painting of a mulberry branch beautifully executed in indigo and a brown. I find it interesting that I was able to achieve all of the colors in this painting with just indigo, although I doubt that the brown used in the Chinese painting was such. I prepared these samples in the first week of November, well past my normal harvest time for indigo. I was actually surprised there were many leaves left. But look at the colors I was still able to achieve. We have the robin's egg blue of just the fresh cold leaf. We have the teal green, that is that same robin's egg blue if it's allowed to dry before washing. The yellows we saw produced earlier, the yellow in combination with the coral gives us this cornflower blue, and then of course the wonderful shades of coral itself. If you look in the upper left hand corner, you'll see the leaves as they appeared when I was harvesting them. It was cold enough that the indican had begun to retreat from the leaf, exposing the indirubin. 
we look down in the lower right hand corner, I was really pleased to come across this photo of an Okinawan tide pool, reflecting exactly the same colors I was able to achieve with fresh leaf indigo dyes, dyes that we don't normally consider part of indigo in our everyday appreciation of the beautiful navy blue we're all familiar with. As a young man, Kamakura Yoshitaro traveled to Okinawa in the early part of the 20th century. He became totally fascinated by the culture and quickly immersed himself in it. Trained as an artist, he traveled the island sketching everything he saw. He also made extensive use of the newly available technology, the camera, to back up and corroborate the intricately detailed sketches he made of all that he saw. Particularly drawn to the Bingata textiles, he made extensive notes of everything involved in the process as the Okinawans eagerly sought to share their vast body of knowledge with him. This generosity of spirit on both sides played a crucial role in how history played out at a later date. As I'm sure you know, both Okinawa and Tokyo were very heavily bombed during World War II. In the case of Okinawa, this meant pretty much a leveling of the islands, destroying all architectural treasures, civic records, and of course artists' studios as well. Along with this tragedy, the bulk of the records collected by Kamakura were also destroyed in the bombings of Tokyo, but some did survive. The photograph you see in the upper right hand corner is an example of one such item. In his youth, he not only took this photograph, but he drew out the floor plan of the castle and made extensive sketches of all of the artwork found on the walls and the architectural detailing. Thanks to his intense love of Okinawan culture and his incredible eye for artistic detail, Kamakura's notes and photographs were used as the basis for rebuilding Shuri Castle beginning in 1958. I'm sure you can appreciate the Okinawans love of vibrant dynamic colors and these pigments used in the building are exactly the same pigments used on the textiles. Tragically, the castle suffered another fire in 2019. Along with all of his architectural notes, a priceless collection of traditional Bingata stencils and fabric samples survived. Kamakura found himself in the unique position of being able to give back to the people who had opened their arms to him in his youth. This treasure trove of information was used to jumpstart, to reinvigorate Bingata culture in Okinawa. While of course a great deal was lost, the bulk of what you see today is very heavily dependent upon those historical pieces that Kamakura rescued. The image you see here is one such example. This particular piece was executed by a professor at the University of Ryukyu. However, it's also an image I've done, uh, my fellow classmates have done. Just about everyone winds up doing this image and similar images sometime in their career. Harkening back to these older images is not due to a lack of imagination. It's not considered plagiarism. It's simply recognizing the importance and the cultural significance of those images that are part of this legacy. During the 1960s and 1970s, during Japan's boom in traditional crafts, Kamakura published comprehensive, full-color, oversized editions containing samples of his collection of stencils and ancient fabric samples, giving us all the opportunity to learn from these treasures. This pheasant image is typical of many images drawn from this warehouse of information that you'll find appearing in many traditional Okinawan textiles. I've used it myself and I'll show you an example of that a little later on. And here we see a few more samples of traditional Okinawan pieces produced from Kamakura's work in all of their energetic, colorful splendor. We've discussed using stencils extensively, so let's spend just a moment on tsutsugaki the method of applying rice paste with a cone. The same basic recipe using powdered sweet rice and bran used to make the rice paste for the stencils is also used with the cone. The rice paste is placed within the cone and the paste is squirted out much like drawing happy birthday on a cake. You can see in this picture the artist is following an outline in blue. That blue is that very same aobana used for underdrawings that we talked about earlier. And of course it's comforting to keep in mind that all of that blue will disappear once the fabric is immersed in water to remove the paste. On the left you can see a contemporary tsuzugaki piece executed with synthetic dyes on cotton. Once the war ended, the dyers were desperate for supplies to continue their artwork. And of course they did whatever any resourceful person would do. 
They scrounge through rubbish bins for the last dregs of lipsticks left behind by a GI's wife. Or, finding shell casings everywhere, they converted those into the tips of their cones for doing tsutsugaki. And in the back of this particular sample, you can see the shadow of English lettering. That's because an American flour sack from the commissary was pressed into service. Old American sheets were used to do dyeing, as you see with these lobster pieces above. Stencils were carved from old wartime topographical maps, and even shards from old broken 78s were used to help push the paste through the stencils and onto the cloth. As dynamic and appealing as the older samples are, simply reproducing them blindly leaves us with nothing more than a fossilized art form, something pickled in formaldehyde. In order for an art form to be alive, it must continue to change and grow and interact with modern society, to be part of an ever-changing cultural core. On the left, you see very traditional bingata techniques employed by a contemporary artist, making them ever more surrealistic, with the boats, the fishing nets, the birds towering over the tiny village below, conjuring up images of Mothra or Godzilla trampling through the city. In 1972, when Okinawa was passed to Japan, there was a huge boom in interest in mainland Japan in all things Okinawan, and in particular, Bingata textiles. Artists such as Kamakura and many others, such as Serizawa, whom I'm about to introduce to you, worked very diligently to popularize these textiles. One of the issues were the tropical colors. Wearing a Bingata kimono in Tokyo was much like a tourist wearing a Hawaiian shirt in Stockholm. The colors really needed to be adapted to a Japanese aesthetic while maintaining their exotic bingata look. The piece on the right is a beautiful example of such an effort. It has the wonderful imagery of Okinawa, the distinctive form of highlights and accents, a wonderful play of colors, yet toned down and a bit more muted than you would find in Okinawa. This particular piece has developed a bit further, removing any hint of the tropics, yet maintaining the traditional bingata techniques, general color sense, and methods of applying accent marks known as kumadori. Serizawa Keisuke's artwork is well known on the international front. Both he and Kamakura are designated National Living Treasures of Japan and are contemporaries of one another. Both were in Okinawa about the same time. Serizawa's interest extended to folk arts from around the world, including African, South American, and Southeast Asian. As a result, the subtle flavors of many other folk traditions may be found in his beautiful artwork. The pieces above are all done on paper using the same pigments we've been discussing. These are calendars. It's not the least bit unusual for world-renowned Japanese artists to be commissioned to do throwaway calendars, matchbook covers, menus, as well as major installations in art institutions, bringing beauty to everyday experiences in our lives. Serizawa capitalizes upon an angular quality to Bingata stencils, imbuing his work with a crisp, spontaneous feel. I'd like to take you on a detour to mainland Japan for just a moment. This is a fisherman's robe. It's called a maiwai, and it comes from Chiba Prefecture. Chiba is just north of Tokyo. They're worn by fishermen to celebrate a safe homecoming after a long stint at sea. While I haven't found any historical information directly tying them to Okinawa, I find it very curious that these kimono have a very similar aesthetic to bingata, and they employ exactly the same techniques, using rice paste resist, through stencils, and an abundance of natural pigments. I don't think it's too far-fetched to imagine that these two seafaring groups had contact with one another. Staying within the same general region of Japan, I'd like to share a noboribata with you. The silhouette on the right shows how it would normally be displayed. This particular piece would have been hung outside for Boys Day in May. The theme is of Takasago, iconic pine trees represented by the old man and the old woman in no theater. Heavy layers of pigment were applied to both sides of the cloth since it was to be viewed from both sides. But this isn't a dyer's handiwork. This was done by a painter. I stress that fact because painters have their own traditions and their own methods separate from those of dyers. The pigments are very heavily layered and encrusted. They were never intended to be washed, but simply hung out as decoration as you would a scroll or any other painting. 
The net result of painters producing textiles and using their painting techniques is that the colors, the pigments, often fell off or crocked off, as you can see in this particular sample. It's a beautiful painting, but they are not dyes. They were not permanently affixed to the cloth. At best, they had a little bit of Nikawa hide glue to bind them to the fiber, as you would find in any other painting on paper. And just a quick side note, you can see that her face was sketched in originally using sumi, soot, rather than the disappearing aobana that a dyer might have used. Crocking is a term used when pigments rub off a textile. Crocking is not always undesirable. Originally, this indigo dyed piece was quite crisp in its patterning, but it looked as if someone had spilled brown paint spotting its entire surface. The spotting was actually rust pigment applied without soy milk just sitting on the surface. With time, it gradually wore away, it crocked off, just as the indigo eventually wears away to expose some of the white core of the yarns used in the weave. Eventually, all of the iron rust falls away, except for a bit of the pigment, the smaller particles that are trapped within the weave of the fiber, giving us a nice, soft pink tint to the indigo as both wear together to create a very soft, warm, inviting color palette. On a much brighter note, this piece was collected near Osaka. I love the fact that it's combining both aniline dyes and natural dyes, similar to the block prints shared with us by Marco Leona in his earlier lecture. I find this to be a wonderful example of the warm and friendly movement of line that can be found in a more folksy kind of tsutsugaki. It makes me want to believe that some imaginary grandpa living down the street designed and dyed it. The brown tones are iron rust pigments, the black is soot, the peach in the background is thin down iron rust, the yellow is sekio, the orpiment mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture. The remaining dyes are aniline dyes in all of their neon splendor. There are many other categories of textiles in Japan that incorporate pigments and dyes in combination or pigments alone. One such category, a rather large one, is called sarasa. The term sarasa is believed to be derived from a Middle Eastern tribe the Saracens, and the name became associated with the textiles as they traveled along the Silk Road through India and China, picking up additional characteristics along the way. A range of textiles were entering Japan at just about the same time, and distinctions often weren't made between the different categories or sources. As a result, a great diversity of techniques are lumped under the same umbrella. Let's take a look at just a few examples. The textile you've been looking at above is printed with potatoes. Sweet potatoes are carved, much like a woodblock print, pressed into the pigment using a binder. The binder may be soy milk or it may be nikawa. The hide glue. The pigment laden potato is then pressed against the surface of the fabric, creating a print. One potato, one print, as successive layers are built up to create a very colorful piece of artistry. It would seem that the Japanese often had difficulty figuring out exactly how an imported textile was produced and making their best guess. The previous potato print was likely to be mimicking the woodblock prints coming in from India. Perhaps the same can be said for the image above, entirely hand painted. Isn't this a wonderful design? Can you see all the detail? The frogs, the crickets, the staghorn beetles, dragonflies, the snails. It looks as if the artist just had a delightful time creating this piece. The textile in the upper left was also entirely hand painted, perhaps an imitation of Indonesian batiks. And on the right hand side, we see a much more Japanese looking pattern. However, this one is entirely printed by taking hand carved stencils and hand brushing the colors one at a time through them. So just as with the potatoes, it's one stencil per color as you build up layer after layer. Let me take a moment to share some of my own artwork with you. One of my earliest pieces under the tutelage of Hayashi Matsuyo is a piece using typical Okinawan color application and a stencil I carved from one of the designs in Kamakura's publication. Bright, bold pigments, a flower is a flower, but no attempt was made whatsoever to color the flowers in a realistic manner. Here you can see how my stencil relates to the dyed piece underneath. The blank areas of the stencil are the blank areas of the cloth. And on the left, I'm applying dyes using a surikomi brush over one of my images. Notice how the pigment continues over onto the paste. As long as the paste is doing its job, it will be protected from being stained by any of the pigments or dyes. 
Early on, I played around to see how the pigments would work on different fibers. On the left, you see me dyeing primarily indigo pigments on the backside of denim. In the center is a wide range of pigments over silk chidi men. And on the right hand side, you see the same colors, more or less, more of a rust tone, on paper. The stencil in the upper left hand corner was given to me by my teacher and she happened to mention at the time she was doing so because she didn't particularly like it. It had been given to her by her teacher. Okay, well, I liked it just fine. So I used it in many pieces. In the bottom left, again, you see the backside of denim being used with indigo. Just above that is a more vibrant combination of colors over Indian cotton. I came across this hauri, as it happens, on eBay, just as the auction was about to close. I quickly bid, I won, and when it arrived in my studio, with some trepidation, I placed my stencil over the top of it just to see if it came close to matching, and it matched exactly. Normally, when an artist is reproducing a design, some idiosyncrasies are introduced. Lines become a bit thicker, leaves are turned just a bit, uh, oddities are introduced. In any case, this matched precisely, and there's only one answer to that. This stencil was used to produce this textile. I know I didn't produce it, and I know my teacher didn't produce it. I doubt her teacher did, since he wasn't fond of the stencil, so that means that probably whoever originally carved the stencil dyed this piece before giving it to my teacher's teacher. I'll never know the answer to that, but I do enjoy the idea that this particular howdy made it full circle into my studio in Covalo, California. Remember that pheasant we saw earlier with Kamakura's collection? This is my take on the design. I'm using softer colors and I'm taking a great deal of effort to make sure that the texture of the weave is left exposed. So much for traditional imagery. I also have fun designing my own. In this case, the theme is of strangers sitting on a park bench, sharing their thoughts with one another. The pattern repeats right to left to create a border over a larger image. I enjoy Coptic patterning quite a bit, and you can see the influence it exerts in the icons representing each individual's thoughts. It's never too late to start myths for future generations. Here I'm depicting the Virgin Mary, a bit annoyed finding herself in this position, with an icon of herself in her lap, sitting on the shoulder of Michael the Archangel in the avatar of St. George. As the dragon snatches the icon and flees, and St. George and the dragon engage in a battle, the icon itself becomes a bit bored with the situation, frees itself, and takes flight. While all of this is happening, we can see the three UN observers standing and, well, observing. This was a commission piece for a Shaolin priest. The dragon, in its boldness, wraps itself around the body of the wearer. However, even a dragon can be a bit shy, so this one has its head tucked inside the sleeve only to peek out on occasion. I work a lot with children. Often they propose images that they'd like to have done. This was a group of rancher boys, and of course, they wanted cow eyes. Isn't it fun how this is still in keeping with the Okinawan concept of surrealistic relationship of images? I included this piece to show yet another example of non-traditional Japanese patterning done strictly with indigo from my garden. Well, actually I did add just a touch of cinnabar and cochineal to perk it up a bit, but primarily indigo in both its pigment and dye form. Playing with words is always fun and challenging, and this is my take on Fallen Angel. Only four color sources were used, indigo, cochineal, gohun, and gold dust. The gold, of course, counts as a pigment and was also applied with soy milk. The definition of the wings comes about through the contrast of the matte pigment gohun, the powdered seashell, and the natural luster of the white silk. I'd like to introduce you to Cheryl Lawrence next. She's an artist I truly admire. Cheryl studied with me for many years, but then took off in fantastic directions on her own. She has the ability to use a rich range of subtle hued colors in a very lively fashion. Very true to the Okinawan spirit, yet because she isn't rooted in Okinawan traditions, she's able to take her work into a direction um, far beyond what I'm capable of doing. Which brings us back to an expression that Quincy Nyan introduced in his lecture about indigo, and that's a Confucian saying that in Japanese reads, Aula aiyori dete, aiyori aoshi. Very loosely translated, that means a blue, bluer than the indigo from which it was derived. Which, of course, is an expression of the great gratification an instructor feels when a student can take the knowledge offered and run with it. 
This piece, done entirely with pigments on a silk linen blend, depicts an ocean scene as is common with Bingata imagery, but it embodies that uniquely northwestern ocean feel. She's done a wonderful job of capturing her local environment. Cheryl is also a politically active artist, as can be seen in her recent exhibition, Democracy in Action, Celebrating the Women of the 116th Congress. Katazome with natural dyes on silk, with stitching, and buttons for embellishment. Artists in Japan and Okinawa are beginning to take their own work in very interesting directions. <laughs> I really enjoy how these Western lamps have been used following very traditional Japanese patterning layout, emphasizing the very matter-of-fact attitude that this delightful art form offers. Kamegae Asuka, while working in a very traditional format, manages to infuse her work with a great deal of life and humor, both through the brilliant colors she employs, as well as the whimsy exhibited by the creatures that inhabit her ocean world. Miyuta's Bingata imagery is reminiscent of Rousseau's paintings such as Peaceable Kingdom. And Teruya, a political activist living in New York, has done a spectacular job of tying in the indigenous people's movement of Okinawa with that of North America. And as I wind up, I'd like to share a couple of more pieces with you. Jennifer Steger mentioned in her lecture the distinctive smell that some dyes possess. She touched on pupura, the purple dye produced by shellfish in the Mediterranean, which has a, well, fishy smell to it. And by the way, purple is also derived from shellfish in Japan and is referred to as Yamato Kai Murasaki Zome. Indigo also has a rather musky floral bouquet that repels insects. I purchased the kimono above based partly on its smell. I was confident that the entire piece was done with natural pigments. However, nothing confirmed this more quickly than a quick whiff of the yellow in the background, arsenic. Arsenic, also known as orpiment, has a musty attic smell to it, a little bit along the same lines as poster paint. The upper section is orpiment, the lower section is cinnabar, you can see malachite, azurite, indigo, cochineal, and basically all of the minerals we've been discussing all along. Having covered so many exquisite colors in this talk, I have to admit that one of my very favorite pieces is this simply designed, minimal color, Bingata piece from the 1920s. After applying soot and soy milk over the rice paste resist to create a charcoal gray, the paste was washed away to expose the white background. Additional paste was applied to selected areas to maintain the white segments you see above. Indigo pigment was applied over the entire surface and again washed. Where the paste was applied, the white background was protected as well as the gray of the original soot. In areas that were not protected, the white was stained blue with the indigo, and the charcoal gray of the soot became an even darker shade with the indigo overlay. This traditional process, in which several layers of rice paste are applied along with several coats of color, is referred to as Oboro Bingata. The components of this Chinese character allude to the shimmer of a dragon in moonlight. And isn't that the perfect description of the mood evoked by the understated strength of this piece? And on that note, I'd like to thank you all for having joined me today and allowing me to share my passion of Bingata textiles with you. In the next slide, you'll find a link to my webpage, and on that page will be a list of recommended reading in both English and in Japanese, as well as the links to the other artists and the other lectures mentioned in today's program. I hope you've enjoyed the talk, and I'll look forward to seeing you at the next Pigment Dig in your backyard. <laughs> okay, see you then. Bye-bye.